Hi, and welcome to the Mastering Your Fertility podcast TV. I am Dr. Haley Nye. I'm Kristen Cornett. And we are the hosts and the creators of the online fertility platform, Tiny Feet. So today we are interviewing Dr. Laura Bryden. She is pretty amazing. She wrote the book, The Period Repair Manual. She has 20 plus years of experience with women's health. And, uh, oh, I forgot to mention she's a naturopathic doctor. So um, here in a minute, I'm actually going to read her bio so you can learn more about her. But specifically today, we wanted to talk to her about PCOS. So she knows a lot about it. She's done a lot of research um, trying to figure out different types of PCOS, what's the most ideal way on how to diagnose PCOS. And there's a lot of misunderstanding out there. So Kristen's going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But I am going to go ahead and talk to you about Laura Bryden. So she, once again, is a naturopathic doctor and period revolutionary, leading the change to better periods. She's informed with a strong science background and has more than 20 years of experience with patients. And Laura is a passionate communicator about women's health and alternatives to hormonal birth control. Her book, Period Repair Manual, is a manifesto of natural treatments for better hormones and better periods and provides practical solutions using nutrition, supplements, and natural hormones. Now in its second edition, the book has been an underground sensation and has worked to quietly change the lives of tens and thousands of women. And it is an amazing book. We highly recommend it. It's actually one of the first books that I read about women's health when I first finished my nutrition education. Yeah. And it was um, kind of a major driving factor for me deciding that this is really where I wanted to focus my efforts. So this is a great podcast interview and we have a lot of incredible information to share with you about. PCOS. So like Dr. Haley mentioned, this is kind of a misunderstood condition. PCOS stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome, but it's kind of a misnomer. And we talk about why it shouldn't really be named PCOS throughout the episode. And Dr. Bryden kind of sheds some light on what this condition really is, which is a condition of hormonal imbalance and how we should be approaching it differently than we are in the conventional medical paradigm. So we're going to talk about what PCOS actually is, why it's so often under and over diagnosed, or I guess we should just say misdiagnosed, Mm -hmm. what the actual proper process should be for diagnosing PCOS and why it's not sufficient to just find cysts on the ovaries via ultrasound. We're also going to talk about the four subtypes of PCOS that Dr. Bryden discusses in her book. So we'll talk about insulin resistant PCOS, inflammatory, post pill, and adrenal PCOS. So this is really interesting figuring out all these different nuances to this condition and how, depending on the subtype you have, how it should be addressed differently based on that. And then of course, we're going to go into a whole bunch of natural therapies and options for how you can address the condition naturally to restore ovulation, increase fertility, and improve your overall health. And we have one more thing we want to discuss before we get into the interview. Dr. Haley's going to cover a free resource that we created specifically to help you identify your PCOS. Yeah, so we thought it would be really great to help you identify what subtype of PCOS you might have. So if you're wondering, do I have PCOS? Or if you know that you do, or you've been told that you have PCOS, you can go in and take this free quiz. So it's an online quiz. Um, so you can actually just go into this particular software or this website, answer four, or 15 questions about and it will pop out what subtype that you are for PCOS. And so we've actually recommended that you even pause this episode and go take the quiz real quick before you listen so you know that when Dr. Brighton comes on and she starts talking about that specific subtype, you know to perk your ears up and listen to what she has to say about it. So the link is going to be in our podcast description on our website. So go to tinyfeet.co forward slash podcast. So the link is just right there on uh, the screen and you can find the link to the quiz to be able to once again, find out what subtype that you are for PCOS. And just a reminder that is going to be under episode 24. So tinyfeet.co forward slash podcast and then episode 24. All right. So I think we're going to jump straight into the interview. We hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, Dr. Laura Bryan, thank you so much for being with us today on the Mastering Your Fertility podcast. 
and we're so excited to talk to you today about PCOS. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. So we just want to start off by uh, letting our listeners know how you got into naturopathic medicine and why you fell in love with women's health. Well, I went on the path to naturopathic medicine a long time ago. Um, my background before that was I was an evolutionary biologist. So I was always very interested in biology and how the body works. And, but I decided pretty early on that I wanted to put that into action by helping people. And naturopathic medicine felt like a good fit because it's working with how the body works, right? You know, supporting it with nutrition. From the very beginning, I've sort of um, worked with this idea that the body knows what to do when it's given the right support, when we remove obstacles to cure. And with women's health, that has just been particularly effective because I think that's how my focus grew is through the 90s and 2000s. And I was just treating more and more women for period problems and they were responding incredibly well. And on the other side of things, they really weren't getting many options from their doctors. I mean, they still don't. The, the paradigm currently is it's really the pill or nothing or the pill or fertility drugs or kind of nothing. So of course, as naturopaths, we have just so much more we can do. And the, the human body, the female human body is a dynamic system that responds well. Absolutely. So true. Yeah. And that's one of the tenets of naturopathic medicine yeah. is believing in its innate ability to heal, which is definitely yes. one of the reasons why I went into naturopathic yeah. medicine as well. Yeah. <laughs> so you've been in practice for over 20 years, right? And over those 20 years, you've collected a lot of patient experience, just like you were saying, like women, you're fixing their period problems. And so what made you come up with the idea of your book, the period repair manual? Yeah, it, it was a, it really was a way to, to get it out there to more women because I just heard the same story over and over women saying, oh, I, you know, I feel terrible on the pill, you know, it causes depression or it's doing this, but I need it. I must need it for my skin or my period pain or whatever it is. And just knowing that, you know, of course, no, you don't need it and I can help you. But at some point I'm like, yeah, I'd like to help lots of other women as well. So it was putting together, kind of compiling about 20 years of, yeah, as you say, kind of clinical experience, learning, actually seeing in practice, you know, what works for patients and putting that all together and putting it out there. And what's been interesting is I, I wrote it for women. It's a user-friendly guide for your average woman who I wanted to make women feel smart and make them think, you know, realize they can understand the menstrual cycle. It's not that complicated. But what's been really gratifying is that a lot of other practitioners, including sister naturopathic doctors and you know, GPs and gynecologists and all other sorts of practitioners have read the book as well and are able to get something out of it, even at their level, I think mainly because of just sort of a paradigm shift that I'm trying to communicate with the book, this idea that we, as women, we benefit from our own menstrual cycles, that we need to work with them rather than just suppress them all the time. And I think that's the message everybody is ready to hear. Right. It's just been declared as a fifth vital sign yes. right? by right. ACOG. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's amazing that they are finally recognizing that we can learn a lot about our, ourselves and our health just by looking at our period. So what a great yeah. thing to have that well, men don't have. <laughs> yeah. Well, and just the acknowledgement that it is that important, that it yeah. is a sign yeah. of life, that it is a sign of health and vitality for women, you know, to not only acknowledge that, but then also yeah. that that tells us these are necessary, we need them. And then that kind of begs the question of how we treat women for women's health issues in conventional medicine with the pill or fertility drugs or et cetera. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's so good to bring up that statement from yeah, the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists that, yeah, the menstrual cycle is a vital sign. They, rec they recommend that doctors ask their patients about their menstrual cycles and recommend you know, that doctors advise their patients to chart their menstrual cycles. But here's the question. I mean, how much of that do you think is really happening? It's going to take a while for this revolution well, paradigm shift to happen. Yeah. Right. And not only that, I was kind of thinking, well, if they start asking about their menstrual cycles, but not really knowing what to do about them, is it just going to push more birth, birth control. control pills? You know, like, oh, your cycle is kind of messed up here. Why don't you take a birth control? Pill? I know. And if you think about that, if you really just take a step back and look at what that is. So if the problem that they're identifying a problem that a woman isn't ovulating regularly, 
and the current paradigm where we exist is their solution for that is to give a drug that suppresses ovulation. So it's, it's right. I mean, it's masking it at best, but it obviously way worse than that. You know, it, it's really, it really is. I, I just think it's an emperor's new clothes situation where future generations are going to look back at the era of contraceptive drugs and how we gave them so routinely and just not quite be able to believe that that's what we did. I mean, we, in medicine that happens, right? We look back 50 years ago and think, what were they like? That didn't make, Oh sense. yeah, it's going to be one of those things. Like when doctors thought smoking was healthy and promoted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right, yeah. Inside their doctor's office. I mean, we can't like, even fathom that now. And, and yeah, I right. think there is, there are quite a few elements of how we handle women's health issues, yep. and conventional care that we will probably look back on and go, Hmm. That was, that was unfortunate. That was, yeah. Let's just move on now. <laughs> yeah. And well, especially on the fertility topic, right? So, um, so in your book, you actually wrote a lot about PCOS. And yes. so we're going to talk about PCOS today. Yes. And you are a super expert on this topic. So we're excited to be talking to you about it. So can you give us just an overview of what PCOS actually is and then how it can lead to fertility problems in women? Yeah. Okay. This is a really important topic because there is, um, to say the least, a little bit of confusion out there about what PCOS is and isn't. <laughs> and it's a wee bit, just a wee bit of confusion. And it's unfortunately a diagnosis that's both underdiagnosed, sadly, and also overdiagnosed in that a lot of women are given the label of PCOS when that is absolutely not what's going on. And that can cause a lot of confusion and heartbreak and going down the wrong path of treatment. So yes, let's try to, in the clearest terms possible, define what it is. What I, what I say lately, my way of defining it, so PCOS is a condition of excess male hormones when all other reasons for excess male hormones have been ruled out in simplest terms. Right. So that does mean there has to be some you know, due diligence and ruling out other conditions of excess male hormones, including a condition called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which I mentioned because I just was at a, giving a lecture on the weekend and a gynecologist who was in the audience made the point that she sees a, a lot, I mean, certainly several women who've been told for like a decade or more that they have PCOS, put on the pill for that, which doesn't, isn't treatment anyway, and then discover they actually have adrenal hyperplasia, which affects about one, a one in 100 women. So it's not that, you know, it's not uncommon. Right. She made that point. So I think that's worth mentioning. Can you make, so, uh, just, just tell the listeners yeah. like what, what that is, congenital it's, adrenal hypothalamus. Yeah, it's a genetic condition where mm -hmm. the adrenal glands make excess male hormones. So it's another way to make excess male hormones. Arguably, there are quite a few different ways, reasons, physiological reasons why we might as women make excess male hormones. And that's one of the things I tackle in my, in the PCOS section in my book is to try to break that down a little bit more because even, even with the best diagnosis currently, you fall under the umbrella of the PCOS diagnosis really just means, as I said, you've got excess male hormones and other, other officially known reasons for that have been ruled out. But even then within that category, there are different reasons why that's happening, right? So this is, I think from a very practical choosing treatment side of things. You, you really need to even take it, go a step further. I call it deep diagnosis, not even stop at the PCOS diagnosis, but actually look at what the drivers of excess male hormones are for that individual woman. Usually insulin resistance is a big one. You know, that's a big part of it, but there can be a temporary post pill excess male hormone situation. There is even a an adrenal, a type of a, I call it adrenal PCOS, or I think it's referred to as adrenal PCOS. It's, it's kind of similar to the adrenal hyperplasia, the genetic condition, but it's not a genetic condition. It's for whatever other reasons, the adrenal glands have kicked in and started making too many male hormones. I actually see that a lot in, yeah. in my patients. And it requires a totally different approach. Absolutely. So the, the, the standard approach for the ovarian overproduction of male hormones and the whole insulin resistance side of things requires a different treatment than the, the relatively fewer number of women who have more of an adrenal PCOS. So PCOS as it stands 
is a sloppy diagnosis. You know, it's just a, it's really just a description of a couple of symptoms. It's not describing anything kind of real or tangible, if that makes sense. And this is why some, it's why it's so confusing. Well, I would like to, let's break that down a little bit. So I want to step back actually a little bit. Yeah. So what is PCOS stand for? Yes. And what, what does it mean to have cysts on the ovaries? Are they actually a cyst? And does that mean you have a diagnosis? Do you have to have cysts in order to have PCOS? Okay. Perfect question. <laughs> and, I think, and I think you know the answer to this already, but we'll talk, I'll talk it through anyway. Um, yeah. So the condition is polycystic ovarian syndrome, which would really make you think that the cysts on the ovaries are a big part of it and they're not. So right. in answer to your question, no, it essentially has nothing to do with cysts on the ovary, like zero, which is very confusing when that's been the name of the condition. And that's why most experts are talking about changing the name to something like androgen excess syndrome or really just getting back at the, what's actually going on, which is that this excess production of male hormones and going along with that, you know, impaired ovulation, at least a lot of the time, not always, but there can be a problem with ovulation. So but the problem with ovulation is really more to do with the excess male hormones and potentially the insulin. It's not to do with these, it's not to do with cysts. So we'll just stay on the topic of the cyst thing for a minute. There, there is such thing as ovarian cysts, many different kinds, as you know, you know, at least probably 10 different kinds, including something called an endometrioma, which is more to do with another condition called endometriosis. Those are called cysts, some you know, chocolate cysts. That's a, those are totally separate conditions and those various kinds of cysts can cause pain can sometimes require surgery usually not but you know obviously that's a that's a gynecological issue that needs to be addressed in contrast polycystic ovaries are just ovaries that have a higher number of than average say or of eggs or follicles they're not cysts they're eggs or follicles which are perfectly normal for the ovary and it's really sort of a numbers game. So we know, for example, that young, we have more eggs when we're younger. Everyone I think knows that. So <laughs> the ovaries have more follicles or more so-called cysts, you know, not cysts, but more follicles when you're, we're younger, which is why even in the official PCOS guidelines now, the ultrasound finding cannot be used at all to diagnose or assess PCOS in a woman younger than 20, I think it is, or you know, within a certain, which makes sense because teenagers just by definition have polycystic ovaries. That's what, how, what their ovaries look like. And, but even for, no, interesting. Older, <laughs> even for older women, it really doesn't mean anything because you can have high, relatively higher number of follicles really at any time. And keep in mind, it's a temporary thing, right? Like that's the ovary reabsorbs follicles that don't ovulate. So at any one time, the number of follicles or eggs will look one way and then three months later look totally different, a whole new set of follicles or eggs. So it's, it's not a permanent state. Like it's a dynamic snapshot of something. It's a snapshot of something that's changing all the time. You can have these higher number of eggs, polycystic appearance with the hormonal condition PCOS for sure. It's not always there though. You can have PCOS and not have that, which is one of the reasons for underdiagnosis. You can have polycystic ovaries and everything perfectly normal, like absolutely everything fine. In fact, they say about probably one in four women who are perfectly healthy, perfectly normal would show polycystic ovaries at any one time. You can have polycystic ovaries with another situation called hypothalamic amenorrhea, which is in some ways gets confused for PCOS a lot, which is something one of my key messages these days is to try to bring awareness to that. The condition is called hypothalamic amenorrhea, which is really primarily caused by undereating, And the solution is to eat more. <laughs> and it's very often, and the research is backing this up now, routinely misdiagnosed as lean PCOS, so-called lean PCOS, Yeah, which is a, think about that for a minute, how much of a problem that is. So if you're told, if a woman's told she has PCOS, she's going to 
look online or speak to probably various doctors who might, or clinicians or practitioners who would tell her to go low carb to deal with that. And if she's already in a situation where the main thing that's happening is she's under eating or under eating carbs and she eats even less and then is not getting periods, you know, what's going to happen? She's, she's going to get worse. Right. She's never, never going to get a period. And it's very upsetting. And the worst, you know, the longer she goes without a period, the less she eats. This has been my experience with some women until finally you're like, okay, you're going down the wrong road. This well, not only that, but I mean, when, when women like that would like to get pregnant and they're not, uh, they don't have a period. And then the doctors are telling them that they have PCOS and then they're put on metformin and then yes. they get even more nutrient deficient because yes. metformin depletes B12 nutrients. and folate. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then eventually, oftentimes they get pushed into IVF. And it's like, is that all really necessary in, if you have the correct diagnosis? Well, yes. and the correct investigation to even come to the correct diagnosis. I mean, you have to be asking the right questions and doing the right testing. And, you know, if you're using polycystic ovaries to diagnose the condition yep. in somebody that doesn't have other signs of, of PCOS, then, you yep. know, you've done a huge disservice to that woman, to that woman, and you've put them kind of on that path toward eventually having to go through IVF and never really knowing what was wrong with them in the first place. It's very true. Okay. I mean, you guys have just, yeah, you've just summed up something. You've described something that I'm seeing a lot with patients. Right. I'm sure you're seeing as well. And it's very concerning. It's very upsetting because they po quite possibly didn't need any of that. You know, they really just from the beginning needed to have the right information and be able to eat more to be able to ovulate. Right. Um, so just about on the, still on the topic of this ultrasound finding of PCOS. So I know the ultrasound finding is included as one of the diagnostic criteria for what are called the Rotterdam criteria for diagnosing PCOS, but a lot of people disagree with that criteria, myself included, not just me, but lots of experts. Um, the endocrinologist, Professor Pryor, who helped me with my book, did say to me that basically there is almost no reason to do an ultrasound when diagnosing PCOS. The only reason is to assess the thickness of the uterine lining because in true PCOS, as you I'm sure you know, you know, because the cycles are anovulatory, you can get this thickening long term over years and years, thickening of the uterine lining, which is a problem, you know, in the long term. But as far as she's concerned, that's the only reason to do an ultrasound to assess PCOS. You, you can do an ultrasound to assess ovarian cysts, which, as we've, you know, determined is a separate issue, separate thing. So I really wish, you know, family doctors and would just stop doing all these ultrasounds and scaring women into, there's a, a paper in the British Medical Journal from a couple of years ago that I quote all the time. It, it's basically about this overdiagnosis problem. It's like, it, it says something like, is the modern criteria, she's referring to the Rotterdam criteria, you know, leading to unnecessary PCOS diagnoses. She also in that paper makes the same, makes the point that potentially PCOS is a state, a temporary state that a lot of women can outgrow. Like it, when we're younger, so as teenagers, we're temp all of us are temporarily in a little PCOS, mini PCOS state for a few years. First, our androgens kick in. We get a little bit insulin resistant when we're early teen years. Mm -hmm. That's why we get a little bit of belly fat when we're like 11 or something. Then we start <laughs> with me. <laughs> yeah, it's normal. That's a normal thing for women to do. Then that kind of pushes you into the next stage where you then start to ovulate. And then by the ovulation itself, like the estradiol and the progesterone, the good hormones we make from ovulation, basically kind of reverse the PCOS state. So in a way, if you think about how to move out of this state, it's various strategies, but one way is to start to ovulate and make progesterone, which will you know, automatically kind of push down on luteinizing hormone and anyway, move, you know, move somewhat reverse or change the PCOS state. So it's an interesting way to think about it. That is, you know, with the epidemic of PCOS currently happening, it's for various reasons women are kind of being trapped in what should have just been a, a one stage of development of our reproduction.
Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so let's talk about diagnosis then for a second, because you just talked about how it can be both over and under diagnosed. So yes. diagnosed by just doing an ultrasound and saying you have cystic yep. ovaries. Yeah. I mean, under diagnosed by not looking into some of these, you know, other criteria that could be causing this, or, you know, there's, there's a ton of different issues with diagnosis. And as you mentioned, there are different criteria that many experts disagree with. So yep. What is kind of the, the gold standard diagnostic criteria for PCOS? What should we be using to properly diagnose this condition? Yeah, so in my book, I, I prefer the Androgen Excess Society criteria, of which um, basically it's kind of three things. I mean, I don't have it right in front of me, but basically some evidence of high androgens, whether that's high male hormones on blood test or just clear signs like hirsutism. Body yeah. hair and significant body hair too, not just a couple, a little bit of you know, tiny straight hair. Hairs. Yeah, we're talking like <laughs> excessive, coarse, yeah. dark hair in yes. places like you know your chest or your back or your face. Yes, your arms. Exactly. So that plus potentially you know some evidence of irregular ovulation. Plus, and then third criteria is that other reasons for that have been ruled out, which is actually the, the moment when the doctor should have said been able to pick up hypothalamic amenorrhea, right? Like that's built into the criteria. They should be able to say, is there another reason this patient isn't ovulating? Oh, she's not eating enough. That's what's going on. You know, that, it's just that kind of last step of ruling out other things has not been happening. Yeah. So we've got the congenital adrenal hyperplasia. We've got, um, we've got hypothalamic. Yeah. yeah hypothalamic amenorrhea. amenorrhea. We've got some other conditions in there too, like thyroid dysfunction yeah. uh, can be a driver of this yes. as well. And you, I think you mentioned a couple others in your book. It's escaping me right now. Prolactin. So high prolactin can look very much like this. High prolactin can cause androgen male hormone type symptoms as well. And so I guess what we're saying is that if you're listening to this as a woman who has been, quote, diagnosed with PCOS and you haven't had these looked at, you've been diagnosed purely from ovarian, quote, cysts showing up on an ultrasound, yeah. you need more investigation. Yes. Yes. That's exactly it. That's the sentence. You need to go back to your doctor. Right. I have a list of, in my book, a section called how to speak to your doctor. You know, a few of those questions are there. And just Oh, that's great. Say, have I, you know, how was this diagnosed? Was it only ultrasound or are you, did you see something else on my blood test that made right. you think this is PCOS? Do I have insulin resistance? That's, you know, the very next step. And you might have to actually coach your doctor through, <laughs> kind of through the proper diagnosis. Diagnostic Doctors procedure. just love that, right? They just love oh, to definitely. be coached through how to <laughs> properly diagnose. Well, most of them, yeah, sure most of them do want, they want to help though. Of course, they want yeah. to make sure you get this right. And just in terms of underdiagnosis, just for anyone out there, you know, if you know someone who has always had very long cycles, maybe only a few periods a year, who, you know, has hair loss, kind of facial hair, and no one's ever because sometimes what will happen is you, you, you know, you're not getting periods. The doctor's like, oh, just go on the pill to regulate your period, which you can't do. And never, like, never stop to say, oh, actually, this could be PCOS. And so not really even knowing about that diagnosis until for years, until you try to come off the pill and then, then discover, okay, now I can't ovulate. I'm having troubles. I mean, it'd be so much better, obviously, as a younger woman to know what that is so you can take steps nutritional steps to reverse that. Oh yeah. Well, we have, you know, we're, we're waiting longer and longer to have babies. And so women with PCOS who've been put on the pill, either in their young twenties, they might be on the pill or some type of contraceptive for years until like their mid thirties. And then they're finally ready to have a baby and they go off and they realize, Oh, I have a year plus of trying to figure out how to ovulate again and yeah. regulate my cycles and understand this insulin resistance. And it, it could be really disappointing and frustrating and unfortunately can really push people into fertility treatments because they don't have, whether they have not have the patience or just, you know, they, they don't have the direction and, and somebody to direct them on how to get their, their ovulation back and, to manage the PCOS? A big part of the problem, I think one of the reasons we ended up in this situation, I mean, we collectively is, you know, that so many women are kind of only finding out quite late in the game that there's a problem. has been this practice of giving the pill to regulate cycles when it can't do that. So right. it can't do that. It could never do that. You know, those pill bleeds are not periods. 
the pill induces really more like a chemical menopause state, and then this drug induced bleed, which means nothing. And what it, I mean, there's so many problems with that, but one of the problems of what we're talking about today is as a teenager or a 20 something, or, you know, if there was this problem, something that's showing itself, you weren't able to, you weren't, your body wasn't learning how to ovulate regularly. That was showing up years ago, but rather than take that as information and look at what that could be, it, it's ma it kind of masked, well, not kind of, it's masked by these, the pill and drug induced bleeds and yeah, sort of missed opportunity to fix that. And it's, it's really, it's quite sad, but I mean, at the same time, that's why conversations like this are important because there's probably lots of listeners who can, you know, it's still, you know, can still obviously do a lot to help themselves, can tell, help tell other people, can help their daughters. So as the next generation of teenagers comes around and they're having irregular cycles and bad skin, you can say, wait, actually, there's some other things to do. It might be better to actually fix this problem and help your body to ovulate regularly for all the reasons for future fertility, but also all the good things that happen from ovulation for long-term health. Yeah. I mean, I think we also just need to make sure that like women have this information in hand when they're younger, because yes. now we're in a situation where we're speaking to a lot of women who are getting to their 20s and their 30s, and they are literally just now having to discover how their body works because they're being forced to because they can't get pregnant. And yeah. that kind of, you know, not being able to conceive does one of two things. It either forces you into the hands of your doctor to maybe get you referred to fertility treatment or to, you know, have basically drugs given to you to try to make you ovulate, you know, et cetera. Um, or, you know, I guess the other option is spend a whole bunch of time and energy and frustration on trying to figure out what's wrong with you <laughs> yeah. on your own. And so having better resources and, you know, I think obviously shows like this one can help people do that. But I really wish that we gave better education to women when they're younger. You know, the sex ed that I received in school was, you know, forgive me, crap. I, I didn't really learn anything about how things were supposed to work. It's like, here's a tampon and yeah. here's how you use okay, it. And, and the, the boys pads. and the girls get separated into different classes. <laughs> and I, that's like literally all I remember about it. I, I never once remembered hearing anything about hormones, about talking to me about my estrogen and my progesterone, my LH, my FSH. Kids are smart enough to understand that if you just explain yeah. to them. I love that. I love the way you just said that. Absolutely. Girls are smart enough to understand this. Very much. I've had this conversation a couple of times lately. Sex education has been, here's a tampon. Don't get pregnant. Mm -hmm. You know, it's pretty much just fear-based. Right. Body, here's all the, the STDs body, that you can get. Yeah. The body is a scary, <laughs> scary place. You know, oh, we got a horrific yeah. child uh, birth video. Like yeah. in my high school class, they gave us this like screaming bloody video, like nothing about how amazing and transformative childbirth is. It's no. like, this is, you know, terrible and gross and painful and you don't want this to happen to you. And I mean, that's the kind of sex education that, that I got as a kid. I don't know if everybody's experience is like that. Maybe it's better now, maybe not. Well, and the other big thing, the paradigm, this is, it's, I just keep coming back to that word because that's very much what we're in. We're in this strange paradigm of women's health where the idea has been and is still in most doctors' minds that we don't need ovulation or hormones until we're ready to make a baby, which is crazy because it, that would be like saying to men, quite literally, you know, you don't need testosterone until you're ready to make a baby. So we're going to give you this drug to shut it all down. And when you stop the drug, eventually it's going to be harder to kind of get it going again. But don't worry because that's how we do things. Isn't that insane? Like that would never be acceptable. Never like happen. men would be like, um, I'm I, fat and I feel terrible and I can't yeah, exercise exactly. and you know, my mood sucks and yeah. we would complain about these symptoms. So, you know, we had this whole idea for male birth control and mm -hmm actually, we, I think this was in Jolene Brighton's book. We just recently had her on the podcast as well. Yeah. And I don't think we talked about this specifically, but in her book, she talks about when male birth control was actually introduced and they did a yeah. study and the men found the side effects intolerable. Yeah. So, so they, they didn't the pursue study. putting it on the market. It's like, and of course we're dis dismissing women's experiences of side effects with the pill and all these other things that we need our hormones for that we're shutting them off and saying, eh, there's no side effects from taking the pill. And yet we have these men that are saying this was terrible for me and we take it off the market. So yeah, you're totally right. Paradigm is the perfect word to describe what it oh, is no. that we're and 
living we don't it. Val we don't value women's hormones, we, so we don't value ovulation, and yet our hormones are important for everything. I mean, not just for making a baby. I know your podcast is about making a baby, so they're important for that, obviously, but they're also important for just long-term health, just, you know, prevention of disease. Again, the endocrinologist, Professor Pryor, who helped me with my book, said this dramatic, this really dramatic thing, um, revolutionary thing, which is that 25 to 40, or sorry, 35 to 40 years of ovulations protects women, you know, helps to prevent osteoporosis, dementia, heart disease, and breast cancer. And yeah. she's saying that because of progesterone specifically that we make after ovulation helps to prevent breast cancer. And just to be clear, there's no progesterone in the pill. They call it progesterone, but it's not. It's contraceptive drugs that have different effects from our own hormones. So yeah, to not kind of let young women ovulate is to rob them of all of that. My favorite hashtag for social media now is right to ovulate, hashtag right to ovulate. I'm trying to use it. Just, oh, that's oh, going on our list. That's <laughs> going on our hashtag list. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Well, and these are the conditions that you just mentioned that women are at a higher risk for if they don't ovulate. These are the things we already know from studies that women with PCOS are at a higher risk of developing later in life. And that's one of the reasons that it's so important to really understand this condition, diagnose it correctly and yeah. address it correctly when women are young, instead of putting them on the pill to suppress their symptoms and then discovering it, you know, getting diagnosed with it definitively 10, 15 years later when they want to get pregnant. You are exactly, you just said it again, just perfectly. I mean, yes, a lot of those long-term effects from PCOS are from the lack of progesterone mm -hmm. that because you don't get the opportunity with the condition to ovulate regularly, but it's, it's reversible. And also, yes, what you just said, putting on the pill doesn't really change any of that. You know, it suppresses the skin symptoms, for example, and maybe the facial hair to some extent, but it doesn't fix any of that underlying long-term risk or underlying problem. Absolutely. Yeah. So there are other reasons that women who have PCOS are at a higher risk for some of these conditions. And that has a lot to do with the drivers behind these yes. different types of PCOS. So yes. let's dive into that. You mentioned four major subtypes in your book, the period yes. repair manual. So you talk about insulin resistant PCOS, adrenal yes. PCOS, post pill PCOS. And then the last one that we didn't talk about yet is inflammatory PCOS. Yeah. So we're going to kind of ask you to go on a long road here and okay. go through <laughs> all four of these and just talk about some of the drivers behind each one. Okay. Yeah. Good question. So first of all, I don't want to make it sound like they're four evenly distributed types because actually the insulin resistant type is the biggest one. Right. It's, it accounts for about 70 to 80% of PCOS diagnoses. So it's the main one, which is understandably why it gets the most attention. So in that situation, insulin resistance or prediabetes is a major driver of what's going on. I won't say a cause, because it really does seem like the cause is, the cause is a combination between genetics, absolutely epigenetics, probably in utero exposure to potentially male hormones, environmental toxins. It's the system is calibrated, so to make more androgens, to make probably higher LH, all of that process is worsened by insulin resistance. And actually a high male hormone state can actually worsen insulin resistance. So it becomes a bit of a vicious cycle. But to reverse, just so there's two ways to, we're still on the topic of the first one, insulin resistant PCOS. The way in is to reverse insulin resistance, which is very doable with supplements, diet, exercise. Maybe metformin, but again, I think the other things work better than metformin. And then the second aspect of treatment is some way to lower male hormones as well, it can be very helpful to kind of break that cycle and allow ovulation to kick in. And then ovulation itself reverses the PCOS state, kind of what I was said earlier. So once that can start to happen, the condition is reversible. So PCOS, you know, I would agree it's not curable. The word cure is problematic in almost any conversation, but it's reversible for most women to the extent where if you don't have the symptoms anymore, you don't you have really it. Don't, you don't have it by definition because it's really just diagnosed based on what symptoms you have. So that's the first one. I'm sure a lot of your listeners would know about how to reverse insulin resistance. Um, I mean, yes, cutting sugar is a big, big important first step. Sugar is a major driver of insulin resistance. Not all carbs necessarily, although that's a bigger conversation, I guess, how low carb to go. Then magnesium, inositol, 
the supplement inositol, you know, I'm sure you guys know, it's a superstar in, yeah. in, in supplements right now. It's an evidence-based medicine. It made it into yeah. the new international guidelines for PCOS. So it passed all the, you know, tests that it needs to do to get in there. So yeah, I don't hesitate at all. I think it's a really important supplement. And pretty Works. safe, really. Yeah. Safe when you're trying for pregnancy, safe when you're pregnant, potentially, if you want to do that. You know, it's, um, it's an amplifier. You probably know, it's, it actually works inside the cell. It amplifies hormonal signals. So it kind of amplifies the signal at FSH, um, which is important for ovulation, improves insulin sensitivity. It's great. So I feel like it's I'm doing compared uh, to metformin, right? So that's yeah. how they're saying that it's just as effective, yeah. if not maybe more effective than metformin. Well, and I'd say it, its mechanism of action is better. You know, it's yeah, sort of without the side effects and the yes. excessive nutrient depletion on yes. specific things that we need to get pregnant and have a healthy baby. We just posted about this on Instagram recently yeah. about the folate and the B12. And I mean, come on, those are like two really major things that you need to make sure you have enough of if you're going to get pregnant. I'm totally going to follow you guys on Instagram. I don't know how to, I will do that as soon as I get off this call. I don't already. I'll send you um, more info. But, yeah. But we, it sounds like we're doing a little infomercial for an but you know, it's the other great thing about it is it's not expensive. There's lots of different brands out there. You know, it's, it's very much a medicine for the people. It's, it's great. So, and exercise is really helpful for insulin resistant PCOS. So that's a big part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. But then we have, the maybe 30% or so of women who have a PCOS diagnosis and do not have insulin resistance. So first step, step one, going back to earlier in our conversation, first step is actually to say, do you really have PCOS? Like, or is it hypothalamic amenorrhea that's misdiagnosed as PCOS? That's a very real question. If, and, and one of the ways I distinguish between the two with my own patients in my clinical work, and I've blogged about this, is using the hormone LH to distinguish. I find it extremely helpful. I don't know if you guys use that, but yeah. day two or three in ratio to FSH, because both hormones, FSH and LH, two hormones from the pituitary, they both go up with age. So there's no one, one reference range. It has to be kind of age appropriate. But if LH is looking significantly higher than FSH, and especially if it's not accidentally measuring it, LH surge that just happens just before ovulation, which is something you really need to take care of. But if it's a early in the follicular phase, elevated LH, to me, that's strong evidence that it is the, it is a PCOS picture, as opposed to hypothalamic amenorrhea tends to have low LH. So it's just one way for those tricky cases. Yeah. So you're saying to get the LH and the FSH measured on either day two or three of their yeah. menstrual cycle with day yeah. one being the first day of bleed. Yep. Okay. If they're cycling, if there's right. no cycle at all, it's going to have to be random day, obviously. But then the, the check just to make sure that is a valid test is to wait in two weeks, make sure there's no period within two weeks. And then you can accept that as a test because if a period comes two weeks after a high LH, that's normal. That's <laughs> ovulation. That was an yeah. ovulation. <laughs> And I've seen that so many times, actually. I've seen that where they're like, I was told I have PCOS based on this high LH. And then you say, well, when did you get your period? It's like two weeks later. Two weeks you know. later. Yeah, no, that's no. So just no. You have to retest it in that. <laughs> just no. <laughs> yeah, just no. So, right. So this is called lean PCOS. Just to be clear, I mean, typically insulin-resistant PCOS goes along with the apple-shaped weight gain around the middle. But not always, just to make always, there's always the, like a but, right? Always an if, or always a. Mm -hmm. So it is possible to have insulin resistance and not be overweight. It is also um, potentially possible to be, I wouldn't say it's possible to have full apple shaped obesity and not have insulin resistance, but it is possible to maybe be what you consider above normal weight and not be insulin resistant. So it's not that straightforward. That way. So that's why it's so important to test for insulin resistance which I do. That's the very next test. And so are you testing fasting insulin or are you including L other tests in that as well? Yeah, it's a very good question. So, well, first of all, we should just establish that a test for fasting glucose is not a test for insulin resistance. So right. you can definitely have normal glucose and still have insulin resistance. So yes, exactly what you said. Test, you have to test the hormone insulin. 
a couple of ways you can do it. Fasting insulin is, it's not that sensitive. So if it's, you can use it, like if, if it comes back high, then it's definitely, I would say definitely insulin resistance, but you can have insulin resistance and the fasting insulin doesn't quite pick it up. So you have the test I do is down here, it's called a, gluc a glucose tolerance test with insulin. So you measure fasting insulin and then you take a sweet drink and then you measure it at the one and two hour mark. And that's, that's, that's I'd say the gold standard down here now at least um, in Australia. And then the other thing is called a HOMA, H-O-M-A IR index, which is three fasting insulins with a fasting glucose ratio over 22.5 or something. It's like it's wow, a calculation. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Got it. <laughs> um, yeah, I've done, so, I've done that HOMA at, at ratio. However, I didn't know it was three fasting insulins. So yeah. the lab that we use up here, I think they just take the one fasting insulin and then they divide it by your yeah. calculation you just said. <laughs> yeah, you de it depends on the units too, right? What ratio you're doing. So here they do three, which just means you have to have three blood draws like three times in a row, which strikes me as stressful. So I don't order it, but um, I, think the, I, think it's, I think the better test is the one with the sweet drink and watch it go up. Yeah, and determine if there's insulin resistance and then treat that. And just keep in mind too, what, something that's worth mentioning here, there can be insulin resistance and it can be appropriate to the supplements are good, you know, exercise may be appropriate to do a bit lower carb for a while until there's no, until there's no longer insulin resistance. Like it reverses, right? So after six months, it might be that this quite strict diet that you needed to reverse insulin resistance is now pushing you into hypothalamic amenorrhea. You can swing between the two. Interesting. Right. Yeah, just something to keep in mind as a clinician, you know, watching that. So the the body changes. Insulin resistance is reversible. So I retest it after three or six months and decide and usually relax, you know, relax the treatment a little bit at that point. Yeah. You know, as a nutritionist, I, I just keep seeing this explosion of like obsession with the ketogenic diet and how that's just, you know, the cure all for anything that has anything to do with elevated blood sugar or insulin. And I'm like, okay, you know, I'm, I guess I would be maybe a proponent of that as a therapeutic approach in the very short term. But yeah. I just don't think it's appropriate for most women because we need insulin. We need some insulin and, and it does a whole lot of other things in our body than just manage our blood glucose. And you know we can, as you said, start to swing into a situation where we're basically under eating, we're under nourishing ourselves, or we're not providing enough fiber for the microbiome, or you know, there's all these potential issues that, that can worsen the situation for somebody who's already struggling. 100%. So when, I, when I'm trying to pick up hypothalamic amenorrhea, I'm doing that by asking what they're eating. You know, and sometimes you know, it's not that easy. I mean, you should be able to track that. But I also test for low LH, I mentioned before, and I also test for low fasting insulin. Yeah. So I use insulin the other way. And what you just said, insulin does other things. Insulin is actually important for female reproduction. The hypothalamus is waiting for a certain threshold of insulin to tell it that there's enough food out there to go ahead and make a baby. And Our are so smart. We're, we're, <laughs> we're so intelligent. You know, I, I hate the way that we kind of discount the body's intelligence a little bit um, in a lot of conventional settings. You know, it's, they're, it's smart. Like it knows what to do. Here's a bit of a little trivia for you because I'm an evolutionary biologist. So this is the way my brain thinks. It's interesting. With humans, okay, our ovulations are so sensitive to food supply. And it makes sense more so than other animals because most other mammals can, if when they're pregnant, if they run out of food, they can pause a pregnancy. How cool is that? They can actually hit pause. I did not pause. know that. Did not know that. Or their body can just end the pregnancy, like decide to do that physiologically. Humans can't do that. So once we're pregnant, that's, it's all in, right? It's, and so the stakes are high. You know, basically if you run out of food during a pregnancy, then you both die. So makes sense that the body, the hypothalamus would have some layers of protection in there to not head into a pregnancy if there's even an indication that there might not be enough food. Yeah. I love that. I didn't, that's I so didn't know that about, yeah. you know, other, other animals. That's, yeah. that's really interesting. And yeah, we definitely don't have the ability to do that. And so it does make sense for us to be more sensitive to 
our environment and to have mechanisms built into our bodies and into our, you know, communication pathways, our endocrine system, our hormones, yeah. it makes sense to have those kind of built in to determine whether or not the situation is appropriate for us to reproduce. Yeah, and I also wonder if the, like the empty calories that we're getting are these nutrient deficient foods, processed foods are also indicating to our own bodies that, Hey, I'm not ready for reproduction. I don't have enough of the, the essential nutrients that I need. So yeah, you're overfed and you're starving at the same time. Well, that too. I'm sure that that could be part of it. The big part of the high, you know, the being overfed and entering an insulin resistant state. It's just that we're, our, the signaling mechanism is so sensitive to insulin. It just derails the whole thing. I think when you start getting high insulin, hit, communicating with the hypothalamus and the ovaries, it's like that is potentially if there's a genetic vulnerability to that, that's a recipe for, yeah, this, um, it can't all be late anymore. <laughs> the system has gone offline. It's like that is right. Too much. Sooner. The noise is too yeah. loud. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. you were talking about, so we went over the insulin resistance, uh, PCOS, and then the hypothalamic amenorrhea yeah. or the, the skinny yeah. PCOS that could turn into hypothalamic amenorrhea. Right? Yeah. Well, lean PCOS is actually lean. Lots, yeah. lots of different things all combined. Lean PCOS could be a name that was mistakenly given to someone with hypothalamic amenorrhea or someone who turned into hypothalamic amenorrhea. Lean PCOS would probably also be the name given to someone with adrenal PCOS, like I talked about before. It appears to be, and there's a bit of research about this, completely separate set of things going on. Like it's not related to insulin. There's, for various reasons, it can be linked to stress during childhood, actually, a particular window of during our development, stress. The adrenal glands kind of just pump up their androgen production. I think probably exposure to environmental toxins, epigenetic effects. The adrenal PCOS is actually kind of a hard, from a, as a clinician, it's kind of a hard thing to treat because they really do seem to be hardwired to just make more male hormones, which can be a problem for facial hair mostly. Mm -hmm. But adrenal PCOS probably can become pregnant because they're usually ovulating okay, right? Like it's, it's, maybe not ideal to head into a pregnancy with a higher androgen. So you want to try to lower them, but they're, they can probably still, that's my experience is they can still ovulate. Isn't there some evidence or at least kind of whisperings out there about higher androgen exposure in utero might actually predispose female infants to develop PCOS when they hit puberty? Yep. I would say that's pretty clear in the research. Yes. So that means, it does mean this is going to amplify generation by generation, potentially, that as soon as, um, you know, and, and just to, again, just to kind of shift some of the blame, because as women, we always blame ourselves, like it must be, you know, it must be something I ate, I ate wrong or I did wrong. But I mean, it, it does, there's pretty convincing evidence that some of this trend to higher male hormones is from environmental toxins as well. Oh, so, for sure. <laughs> um, so that's going to amplify potentially, yes, because then when the, you then carry a female fetus and she's exposed to higher male hormones, then she'll have higher male hormones when she's, you know, it's sort of, it's going to potentially, but which is why it's important to try to yeah, reduce male hormones. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, and reduce the toxic exposure yes, that ultimately toxic can exposure. amplify that and make it worse. And yeah. you know, it is, it is kind of sad. Like what you're talking about with adrenal PCOS, the way that these women seem to be hardwired is there is a lot of programming that happens in that HPA axis yes. during early embryo development. And, um, you know, there's just, there's a lot that's going on there and there's some really cool research about how, a fetus can be, you know, programmed to have a um, more sensitive HPA access or basically a more acute stress response, like being hardwired yeah. to have a stress response. And, and so, you know, it is unfortunate to some degree that, that we are kind of causing some of these things with our exposures and the way that we're living our lives is sort of these epigenetic factors and how that that becomes a problem for the next generation. And then once that's a problem, you can see how that would continue through more generations. Potentially, but potentially we can also help to intervene now. Right. And just to give hope to any adrenal PCOS or any of your listeners who think they might have that, it's, I, just, I just say it's tougher to treat. doesn't mean you can't treat it. I mean, you can still get relief from some of the natural androgen reducing treatments that I've listed in a few, place, I, a few places and potentially get results without having to resort to an androgen reducing drug like, um, pill or spirolactone or something like that. So. 
Yeah. There's always options. I mean, natural medicine yeah. has so many more options than, than what women typically get in conventional medicine. And your book is a fantastic resource for mm -hmm. uh, different options in all of the subtypes that you list of, of yeah. the U.S. So yeah. what, where are we next now? Post pill? Well, post pill. We yeah. have to talk about post pill, um, which is obviously important. I know you had Jolene on. I just got a whole book about it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Which is, I mean, it's a real thing. It's, it's definitely a real thing. So there's this, it's a, we can, and the, what happens during the post pill time depends on so many factors, right? It depends on, for one thing, which pill it was actually, because I would say in terms of post pill PCOS, we're more vulnerable to that if we've taken a, one of the androgen suppressing drugs like Jospernone or Cyptrum, which you don't even, in the US, you don't even use that. But in Australia, I think the UK, we use this horrible drug called Cyptrum as part of many birth control pills, which um, creates such a suppressed androgen state that when you stop it, you're going to get a rebound mm. androgen effect, which just makes total sense. Because the body, if you think about it, the body's been responding, it's been under the effect of this drug for years. It's having to kind of upregulate, it's trying to make androgens and skin oils and things to try to overcome that drug. And then you remove the drug and then there's going to be a you know, surge in engine. So I see that quite often. It's not very, it doesn't take much to qualify for a PCOS diagnosis during that first year or two off the pill. Um, I mean, really, as we said, it's the diagnosis process is a little bit problematic in that how loose it is. So if you go into the doctor's office post pill, you've got, you're having a regular ovulation, which totally makes sense because you're coming out of a state of suppressed ovulation. Plus, you know, the occasional breakout, skin breakout is enough to basically qualify women for PCOS. So the, my main message to post pill, so post pill PCOS is if you never had the problem before, like if you had regular cycles before you went on the pill, you know, you might've had a bit of acne, but no really clear signs of hirsutism or facial hair, or body hair, anything like that. And then you can probably take heart that it's just a temporary, it might just last, a, it can last a year or two, but with treatment, the symptoms can be minimized and it, you're probably just going to move past it. So it's a situation of temporary androgen excess, um, which is different from if you always had irregular periods and no one just ever diagnosed it and put you on the pill as a way to suppress it, but never told you, you had PCOS, <laughs> then, you know, then you're maybe more just actually revealing something that was quite real that was there, which isn't technically, I wouldn't classify that as post pill. Right. I, by post pill, I kind of mean pill induced PCOS really. Yeah. Or withdrawing from the pill. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Jolene Bryden goes into extraordinary detail <laughs> about all of the, uh, all of the different things that women can kind of do just to generally balance their hormonal systems out afterward. I think she has some specific recommendations and then you also have some wonderful recommendations yeah. in your yeah. too. So yeah. that, I guess, brings us to our last category or yes. our last subtype of PCOS. And this one's really interesting because a lot of different yeah. things could be driving this one and that's yeah. inflammatory PCOS. Yeah. Well, that, this came out of my observation of some patients. I'm sitting there with them. It's like, okay, they're not insulin resistant. This is not adrenal androgens. This is kind of looking more like a real PCOS situation. But the main thing that's going on with them is a degree of inflammation. It can be an autoimmune type inflammation. It can be just more of a um, what's called endotoxemia or kind of gut, gut sourced <laughs> inflammation um, that just interferes with the hormonal system in terms of the mechanisms of why that would drive high androgens. I think it's probably a few things going on. I think it's just disturbing the communication between in what's called the HPO axis, the hypothalamus, hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis, and also um, a situation of high of chronic inflammation, I think can hypersensitize androgen receptors and also the production of um, DHT or like kind of the active androgen from testosterone. So there seems to be a bit of evidence that, supports the idea that that can happen. So for that group of patients, I would then maybe still offer some androgen reducing treatments, but also focus in on the, on the inflammation and say, okay, if this is coming from your gut, or if we know you have autoimmune inflammation, or we know you have a gluten problem, in your case, that's what we need to focus on. Whereas just with gluten as the example, I would say like, a, you know, I would say most cases of PCOS don't need to avoid gluten. Like, I wouldn't make a blanket statement that gluten is a problem for this condition in general. But there's a small subgroup for whom if they're in an inflammatory situation where it can be important. Does that 
that make sense? Yeah. It does. Well, yeah. I mean, you're looking at food sensitivities as a yes. potential major driver of inflammation. Yes. And, you know, we've yes. talked about that a few times on the podcast before. We've had three entire episodes about gut health and how food okay. sensitivities and right. autoimmunity and stuff play yeah. into that. So, yeah, definitely. I mean, if I were to see somebody in clinical practice that was exhibiting signs and symptoms of inflammation, that would be the first place I would say, you know, we need to look at your gut. We need to look at what's going on there. And it's an example of treating the person rather than the diagnosis, right? So sure, she came in with this diagnosis of PCOS that's kind of sitting there, but yet you're thinking, well, actually, I'm looking at a situation of where the gut is the major driver. The main thing are these inflammatory markers, you know, so there's no insulin resistance. So I don't necessarily think that inositol, well, it still could be helpful, but you're not, you're not necessarily going to jump to the standard PCOS treatments without right. first addressing the other things. Yeah. Yeah. The underlying cause. Yeah. And this is very naturopathic, isn't it? This is Yes, it is. <laughs> We're all about naturopathic and functional medicine over here because yeah. I just think that's, you know, that's missing from how women are, are treated conventionally in most cases. You know, the ability to ask why enough times until you really get to a root yeah. cause that you can then address, usually with far less invasive, far less expensive, yeah. and far more effective treatment. Yep. Yeah. Right. Well said. So um, we've talked about the subtypes of yep. PCOS and what can, what kind of things can women do with diet and lifestyle to heal, heal their bodies, reduce their symptoms? Like what, I guess I'd be really interested into like what other androgen reducing herbs and things that you're using. Like what are your go-to yeah. besides my yeah. own? Yeah. Well, so if we're just looking, like I said, you know, very often treating PCOS, it's, you need more than one thing in place. So you, you need to sort of be treating that underlying driver. We've just gone through the four drivers, mm -hmm. insulin resistance, post pill, inflammation, adrenal. And then on, alongside that additional way potentially to reduce androgens, I have a blog post called, it's called the seven best natural anti-androgens. So uh, you know, I just quickly go, go through some. I mean, the, the big one is zinc, actually. I actually find yeah. zinc. One yeah, of you recommend zinc a lot I in your zinc. book. I noticed yeah. that it is kind of a superstar nutrient. It does so many different things in the body and it affects so many different body systems that, yeah, I think it's really undervalued, even in natural medicine. Like, it just doesn't get brought up enough. It's like the humble zinc. It's so boring, <laughs> but yet it does really well. I see clinically that it can improve symptoms of male hormones. Bearing in mind, a hirsutism or facial hair is really slow to change. Even with the perfect treatment, it's going to take months and months to really see that. So you kind of have to commit to things. You know, there's a few other, peony and licorice is a herbal combination that we use a lot down in Australia. I don't know, it sounds common there, but um, it's used heaps down here, actually. <laughs> Even saying heaps is very Australian of me now. And there's, um, there's some, there's some, um, there's some published evidence about yeah. that. Um, yeah. and, and a couple of other herbs, but yeah, specifically yeah. for PCOS, that one seems yeah. to be. Yeah. And also just to, um, I might, I might not list them all right, right now just for the sake of time, but I will also mention again that progesterone, our own progesterone that we make after ovulation has a downward pushing effect on testosterone, a l androgen lowering effect. And that can also be used. I'll, I'll mention, I mean, it, this would be best done under the care of a naturopathic doctor or- Of course, yeah. Doctor, but um, there is something called cyclic progesterone therapy, which is, I included it in my book. It's developed by, or you know, um, promoted by Professor Pryor, who's the endocrinologist who helped me with my book. And she makes the point that progesterone, like real progesterone, micronized progesterone, not a progestin drug like birth control, even though they're called progesterone, but real progesterone, suppresses LH. Um, if you do it kind of two weeks on, two weeks off, it can suppress LH, it suppresses androgens. It pushes down enough on LH and androgens, I think that you can start to get ovulation. So I think I've, hopefully I've described that properly. I do, I've resorted to that a couple times, a few times with my patients. Um, if they've tried lots of other things and are just kind of stuck, um, just to get ovulation going. Mm -hmm. Because once ovulation gets, gets going, It'll, it's a lot easier to keep it going. You know, if that's, that's been my experience. You could yeah. get past those obstacles, whatever they are, and then it sort of takes on a life of its own. It has a momentum because you get the signaling between the brain and the ovaries that is harder to stop. So it's not like everything you had to do to start ovulating. It's not like you'll have to always keep doing those to keep ovulating. Right. 
right. the body will eventually take over and yeah. understand what it's supposed to be doing. Right. It's like, oh, this is what I'm doing. And plus then it's making its own progesterone, which kind of helps with the next ovulation stuff. Well, yeah, because right. hormones are such a, an incredible feedback mechanism. You know, yeah. the, the brain releases, um, you know, signaling to tell the, the endocrine organs to make hormones. And then when we have enough of those things, then it's like a negative feedback loop to the brain. So, oh, you know, we have enough, we don't need to be signaling to make more. So it de definitely does kind of like take on a life of its own if you just support yeah. it to start working properly yep. in the first place. So okay. how about diet? Let's talk a little bit about diet. I think I've already kind of uh, shown my true yeah. colors on not supporting a hugely restrictive mm -hmm. approach. I, you know, My approach is typically to recommend just eat real food is the starting point. And then you can kind of adjust, you know, in the case of insulin resistant PCOS, you can kind of adjust carbohydrate based on symptoms of blood sugar dysregulation and how that woman is doing and, and then kind of play with it from there. But I mean, do you find yourself resorting to really restrictive protocols or like a ketogenic type diet often in practice? Oh, almost never. Okay. I won't say never. I mean, I, there are some women with quite, you know, occasion that someone with very severe insulin resistance who I would say look, I think a, quite a low carb diet would be good short term. I might actually try to refer them at that point to someone who has a bit more experience doing very low carb. I don't tend to do that with my patients. But um, the first thing is just to clarify um, for your listeners that high dose fructose, you know, the whole, in the whole low carb conversation, I think we kind of lose track of side of the fact that I'm, I'm in the camp where I think that sugar as in high dose fructose not not fruit but like dessert, yeah processed you know, fruit, fruit highly juice. refined yeah and it's it's the amount mm -hmm. and i'll share one more little just thing with you because you guys are it's this is good you're quite um scientific minded i mean we're sort of <laughs> speaking about things a little bit higher like different level than I, we might i might normally speak about them but this i'll say it anyway just for you guys and if your listeners are interested um it's to do with there's something about fructose which has not been discussed, which really there's some new research to suggest that fructose is normally supposed to all be metabolized in the small intestine. There's a certain threshold below which that can happen. So with a normal amount of fructose from fruit, for example, or vegetables and just like the amount that our body would expect to have, have all the fructose gets converted to glucose and organic acids in the small intestine, all of it. And then that goes into the body and gets used in all the ways that we would use those things. Above a certain threshold, which we get from soft drink or fruit juice or desserts, it overwhelms the small intestine's ability to do that. And fructose then hits both the microbiome, which it was never supposed to go to, and the liver. And when fructose actually hits the liver, according to this research, it induces some inflammatory changes that impair insulin sensitivity. It's not just, it's not the fact that fructose is a carb, actually. It's, it's, it's just it's the nature. It's not supposed to be there in the liver. And so in this paper, which I can send you for the show notes, the author made the statement that basically the small intestine shields the liver from the otherwise toxic effect, toxic effects of fructose in terms of insulin resistance. So I, wow. when I kind of got that piece of information, I really but that makes sense. So step one for insulin resistant PCOS is get the sugar out. Yeah. Like before, before you do anything else, because if you talk only about carbs, patients get really confused. I've had conversation after conversation with my patients where I'll say sugar is a carb. And they're like, really? Cause I oh. thought potato, I thought potatoes were carbs. So they'll be in a situation where they're trying to avoid all carbs like starch and then being so hungry and so kind of distressed that they binge on like date balls and like dessert type things. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, you just like nothing Oops. good has happened. Yeah. Nothing good has happened. <laughs> that didn't us. work. So, no, that doesn't work. So step one for my patients is get the sugar out. Mm -hmm. No, not, I mean, not freak out, not worry about every bit of fruit. You can have fruit, but not seriously, like the dessert type foods. No. And then and then look at, as you said, whole food, look at protein in the morning because it's so important for hormonal signaling and satiety yes. and protein in the morning, protein every meal, not snacking, not eating after dinner. Doing, like, the intermittent fasting that works for women is not eating after dinner, like not eating between like 6 p.m. and 8 a.m. or something like that, which is just not eating in the evening, you know, just 
fasting overnight, which is yeah. Crazy. I mean, and that's not like taking on an intense fast or anything like no. that. That's really no, mild. That's, that's normal. I mean, we're, yeah. we're meant to be able to do that. If you feel like you can't go that long, you have a problem with your blood sugar. <laughs> exactly. So then you need some help by maybe having protein in the morning, magnesium, you know, yeah. all the things that can help to make you feel better. So that yeah. And my my approach with my patients is to make them feel good. It's like they don't have to be miserable and like if they're craving sugar then let's work to reduce the sugar craving so that they can just stop it at some point with true sugar addiction though sometimes they're done even with all the supportive things in place sometimes there does have to be a moment in time where you're like okay i'm going to stop now i know i'm going to crave for like three days and then it's going to be over you know i'm just going to it really is there's a withdrawal that has to happen for some people but yeah so I'd say most people have that to some degree, like some right. people worse than others, but everybody has that moment. Like when I gave up sugar, I was still eating what I would say relatively healthy. And I still had that withdrawal period. Okay. And I just tell people like, you know, it could last as long as two weeks, but if you eat it, it's just going to prolong that feeling. So you just got to, yeah. you got to stick with it. You got to stay away from it for at yeah. least that like kind of two to three week detox. And, and then you don't crave it anymore. Really? Yeah. No. I generally say to my patients, you know, put the focus on protein three times a day and vegetables, yeah. then eat as much starch as you need to feel good. That's great advice. I love that because it, it allows the patient to then think about how they're feeling and pay attention to their body yeah. and adjust what they're eating based on that. So I think that's perfect advice. Yeah. And some people might just be like, especially if they're going to do it, they could do a low carb breakfast. I think that's reasonable. If you just want to have an omelet for breakfast and no carbs, I think that's a good time to maybe do that. But by the end of the day, most women need something, like some bit of potato or rice, or you're just going to potentially destabilize the HPA axis. Yeah. Really crash I think too. carbs, like carbs with dinner can be really helpful. Like a bit of sweet potato, you know, even 50 or so carbs in the evening, just with that one meal, 50 to 75 yeah. carbs in the evening can really help like keep things stable overnight and just you know, like help women feel better. I feel better. I'm, I'm kind of one of those, I don't have PCOS, but I am one of those people that I just feel better on kind of a, a higher protein and fat in the morning and then eating carbs later in the day. Otherwise I can mess up my blood sugar for the entire day if I eat too much starch or, or you know, too much carbohydrate in the morning. Yeah. A big hit of sugary cereal in the morning is probably the one of the worst things you could do for one could do for <laughs> blood sugar or right? granola <laughs> or yeah. nutrition bar breakfast bar <laughs> yeah. yeah totally exactly so any <laughs> other closing pieces of advice yeah. you give about diet lifestyle supplements anything else you want well, to mention that you haven't my yet? yeah my closing piece of advice for all things period to women is that your body knows what to do you know it's it's possible for you i think we're bombarded by this message that you know, the body's broken, you can't ovulate, you've got this diagnosis or this diagnosis, you know, and this, so we really kind of embody this idea that we're different than, for some reason, there's something different about our body and we can't do it. But that is my overwhelming clinical experience. I'm sure yours is the same is for most women, you can get there, you know, you can get to regular ovulation. It's, it might, for some women, it might take longer than for others, but it's, you know, as long as you're not in menopause, it's the body wants to ovulate. It's that's what it's going to do. So it's just about, you know, to, to keep going. I think the last sentence in my book, period of perimenial is trust your body, play the long game, trust your body. <laughs> it's, it wants to do this. So. Yeah. Such good advice. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we will definitely be linking to your book in the show notes for the episode. Um, anything else you want um, listeners to know about where they can find your work or find you? Yep. I'm at my blog is larabryden.com and all my social media is at larabryden. So definitely come find me on Instagram. Uh, Facebook, Twitter. I'm going to find you guys on Instagram. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we absolutely cannot recommend your book enough. That is definitely yeah. one of like the main resources. Somebody has period problems here. You know, mm -hmm. you need to read this book. There's yeah. so much education and information and really practical, actionable advice. So, you know, you can read this and it's not just like a, uh, like you're going down the rabbit hole of all the science that you'll never understand. This is really written with the end user in mind. Um, yeah. So yeah, fantastic mm -hmm. resource. We highly yeah. recommend. Thank you so much for writing it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me today. It was really, it was really yeah. fun. Yeah, this was really fun. Thank you so much. We appreciate it.
All right. Thank you so much for listening and watching. We hope that you enjoyed this amazing interview with Dr. Laura Bryden and that you've learned a ton of helpful information about PCOS and that you're curious to investigate what your PCOS subtype is. We want to remind you about our special free resource that we created to help you do that. Yeah, so we created the free quiz that you can get at our website at tinyfeed.co forward slash podcast. Click on podcast 24 with Dr. Laura Bryden, and you'll find the link to the quiz where you'll answer about 15 questions and it will tell you what your subtype is and then exactly what you can do about it. And then if you want to learn more, of course, you can go get Dr. Laura, uh, Laura Bryden's book, The Period Repair Manual. She really digs into these four different subtypes of PCOS and tells you exactly, again, some things that you can start to, um, to address those particular symptoms. And she also covers every other type of period dysfunction that you may be experiencing. Right. So this is a great resource for anyone that you know that may be having maybe even a different type of issue with their menstrual cycle or another type of condition such as endometriosis, maybe even like problems with the thyroid. Um, a lot of those things are covered. Hormone imbalances are covered in there as well. So tons of great information. Definitely share that with anyone you know that could use that. Lastly, we just want to invite you to follow along with us on social media. So we're uh, on Facebook and Instagram at tinyfeet.co. We share a ton of helpful information there. We post daily on our Instagram and share in our stories and all kinds of content that can help you on your preconception and fertility journey. And please like and share this video and consider subscribing to our channel and we'll see you next week.